Well, there you go. <laughs> Habits. I love a new year. Does anyone else enjoy a new year starting? Anyone? Just Benny. Just Benny and me. Guys on summer camp. Okay, one or two other guys. A new year is a great, great time. It's a good time to be speaking into habits because this is the time of year a lot of people make new year's resolution. Some of you are just depressed even saying that because you know what the history and what the past has been like in that. But you know what? New Year's resolutions, as bad as they sometimes go, they're a positive thing in that they show that people want to make a positive change. It's, what it's saying is, I'm not happy with everything that happened last year, and for this year, I'm going to try to do things a little bit differently. And so there's a really, really positive angle and a, a benefit to having these New Year's resolutions. The bad news... And there is bad news, is that 92% of those New Year's resolutions will be gone by Valentine's Day. Depressing. Depressing. Are you going to be part of the 8% or part of the 92%? And what ends up happening when we don't make it on our New Year's resolutions is we begin to feel like Paul in Romans 7. I don't know if you've ever read it like that. It says this, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what's right but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. You ever felt like that by Valentine's Day, hey? Where it's just tough, but sometimes that is how things go. That is life. That is the Christian walk. Sometimes you want to do things, you just can't get to it just doesn't work out. And sometimes you really don't want to do things. And those are the very things you end up doing. But for all its goods and bads, I think that in a new year, it always feels like the slate gets a clean. It always feels like you get like a little bit of a new start. Let's just clean the slate. Let's just start again. For some people, it means a brand new grade. And that's amazing because maybe grade whatever wasn't so great. But this year, grade whatever can be much better. I know that I can enjoy it. I know that I can get more out of it. For some of you, it's a new chance at work to work a little smarter, to work a little bit healthier. There's something you, you want to change about that. For some of you, you're going to try that new business idea that you've been putting off year after year. For some of you, and this is definitely Sarah, at home you can finish that project <laughs> You didn't quite finish at the end of last year. And so many of us have got projects that we say, you know what, this year is the year that I'm going to finish those projects. In a new year, you've got a chance to do better with your finances, to finally lose that extra bit of weight. Uh, a new year is a fresh time to start serving in church, to join or to lead a small group, to be more consistent with your time with God. So hopefully your resolutions aren't restricted to things that don't involve God. Hopefully they include Him as well. But all of these things are good, and all of these things are going to improve your life in a significant way. But as you know, none of them happens in one big step. It just doesn't work like that. It doesn't work in one big step. All of these things take lots and lots of small steps. You don't suddenly get a promotion at work. You don't suddenly get out of the debt that you've created you don't suddenly have a healthy marriage. You don't suddenly lose that weight or suddenly have a close walk with God. These things are the result of lots and lots of little steps. Maybe you've never thought about it like this, but your whole life right now, where you're at, no matter what your age is, your whole life up to this point is the result of small decisions you've made along the way. It's the result of small steps that you've taken in a certain direction has got you to where you are now. Those small decisions, if you do them enough, they are what become habits in your life. Your habits matter. So Sean Covey said it like this. He said, our habits will make us or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. And you know that's true in your own life. And I want us to have habits. I certainly want habits that make us, that don't break us, that make me and don't break me. And I'm going to go on a quick detour now. I wanted to start off talking about the small steps, but I'm going to take us on a little detour. But at the end of the message, I'm going to bring the dots together, and hopefully you're going to still be with me then. Are you with me now? 
Okay, good. Because towards the end of every year, Saz and I usually go on holiday, and towards the end of our holiday, we start thinking about the new year. We start thinking about what does, yeah, where are we going to go with church? What, what, what do we feel God is leading us into? Where is God taking us this next year? And at the end of last year, we try to answer this question. What's the single most important thing we can do as church leaders? What is the single most important thing we can do as church leaders? Because listen, there are a lot of things that we can do, and there's a lot of things that we should do as church leaders. We can teach people about a God who loves them. Yes, absolutely. We can build life-giving communities. We can build faith. We can inspire hope. We can shape thinking. We can raise and we can release leaders. We can develop spiritual gifts, and we can build and upgrade buildings. We can plant churches. We can serve the poor. We can address injustice. These are all good things. We can show compassion for the hurting. We can pray for and with our people. We can be with them, listen to their stories, encourage their hearts. All of these things we can and we should do, but... What's the most important thing we can do as church leaders? Here's what we believe it is. The most important thing we can do is to help people find their own life and friendship with God who's come in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing we can do. Are those other things important? Are they good things? Absolutely. Are we going to endeavor to do them? Of course we are. But the most important thing we can do is to help people find their own life, their own friendship with God who came to us in the person of Jesus. So in other words, we need to teach people how to really get to know Jesus for themselves. See, if that happens... Everything else is, is as a result and as a consequence of that. Here's what it looks like, because this is what we want. We want to teach you, if you don't already do this, to start seeing Jesus as a real person through the gospel stories. To start to see him not as a figure that lived long ago, but as a real person. And that happens as we read the gospels. We, we want to teach you how to spend time getting to know him. These are healthy things. I want to teach you to notice from the gospel how Jesus thought, what he felt, what he liked and what he didn't like, what was important to him and what wasn't, how he lived, his rhythms, his patterns, his habits, his priorities, what he spent time on, who he spent time with, how he loved people, how he responded to different people. What brought Jesus joy? What brought him sorrow? What he taught and what he invited people into and what he instructed his disciples to do. These are all things that, that when you begin to read the Gospels and to pick these things out, Jesus isn't just a historical character anymore. He's a person and he's someone that you can relate to and have a relationship and a friendship with. The most important thing I can do is to teach our church from the Bible about who Jesus is and then hopefully whet your appetite enough that you would go home and begin to read the word for yourself. Get to know him for yourself because as you do that, something incredible happens. You fall more and more in love with who Jesus is. You get to know God as Jesus did, as a, as a good father. Think about this. What could be better than churches? filled with people who love Jesus. What could be better? I don't think anything could be better. We can have incredible buildings, but if people don't love Jesus in the building, I think we've got a problem. I think we've maybe missed the mark. We can have amazing outreach, but if people in the church don't love Jesus. We can have an incredible summer camp, but if the church doesn't love Jesus. The biggest priority, the most important thing is that we would have a church that is in love with Jesus more and more. Do you agree with what I'm saying? Good. Here's why this is so good. Because people who love Jesus, they worship passionately. You have to stir up people that are cold in their walk with God. You've got to stir them up to worship. But people who love Jesus, they worship passionately. They serve sacrificially. They give generously. 
and they invite people to church regularly. But it all starts with helping to get you to know Jesus, to find your own life with him. For Sars and I, that's worth giving our lives to. That's a worthwhile endeavor to lay down our lives, to put aside the years and the time, is to see a church that loves Jesus and is growing in their love for him day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Amen? You with me? That was a little bit of a detour, but it's an important thing because this is where I'm gonna connect the dots about our small steps and what we believe God is leading us to in this church. Because you might be wondering, how does learning about Jesus and spending time with him, what does that have to do with habits? Well, here's something. Learning about Jesus happens one verse at a time. It happens one verse at a time. How much of the Bible should I read? Start with one verse. If you haven't started, one verse is sufficient. If you already do one verse, maybe two. But learning about Jesus happens one verse at a time. Getting to know Jesus happens one prayer at a time. Becoming more like Jesus happens one step of obedience at a time. Can you hear where I'm going with this? It's one small step. I really feel like, is it Buzz or Armstrong? I don't know. But it's one small step after the other, one small step, one foot in front of the next. New healthy habits, they are hard to form. New healthy habits, they take time. Change isn't easy, but it isn't impossible either. Your future self is a result of the decisions that you're making today. You have to know that. Your future self isn't just gonna become what you want it to become, it's a result of the small steps that you take today. Starting a few small habits can transform you into the person you wanna be tomorrow. Why is it that so many of us genuinely have good intentions? And we do, don't we? We wanna lose that weight. I'm mentioning that a lot. That must be something uh, coming up in my own life. We, we, it's a good intention. We want to lose that. We want to get out of debt. We want to start honoring God, whatever it is. But we fall and we fail again and again. Why is that? I want to suggest that there's one main reason for that, and it's this. We don't see progress fast enough. We just don't see progress fast enough. And as humans, we want to see things fast. We want to see instant. We want to see absolutely now results. Every advert that you see is a now result. You do these three push-ups once a day, and oh my word, check the six-pack. Every stupid ad between all the videos on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, it's all telling you absolute rubbish. Just do this for one minute a day, and you can look like this. No. No. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. I know because I've tried. It's not possible. Okay, those guys have been working out for decades. It's small steps, and they show you the end results, and they say you can do this by cutting corners. It's not possible. We don't see progress fast enough. You know it. You've lived this out. You decide to start exercising, and here's the rubbish thing. You go into the gym or you start exercising three times a week and you weigh yourself at the end of the week and you're a kilogram heavier. <laughs> you ever had that? And you're like, what is going on? How much would I have weighed if I didn't do the exercise? Would I have been lighter or would I have been heavier? How does this thing work? I don't understand how I gained weight while I was trying to lose it. It just, and you say to yourself, this doesn't work. I'm stopping. I didn't develop the muscles, I didn't lose the weight, I didn't look fitter. Or you start having regular devotional times every day, and then on the way to church the Sunday, the first week you've had devotional time every single week, and on the Sunday you have a fight with your wife on the way to church. And you go, you know what, this devotional thing, this doesn't work for me. It just doesn't work for me. I'm still grumpy, I'm still irritable, I still get angry quickly, it doesn't work for me. Or you cut down on your coffee, or, you, or you're snacking and you feel a little bit better, but you look the same, well then is it really worth it? You know what I mean? Is it really worth it? And so you say, this thing doesn't actually work for me. We don't get results fast enough. And there's something wonderful that, if you know Pastor Craig Grishel, he puts it like this, he says that when this happens, when we start off with a good intention but it doesn't go the way that we think it should, we wrongly conclude and it is a wrongly conclude. We wrongly conclude that small decisions don't matter that much. If I'm just gonna do a small thing and it's not gonna even have a difference, then you know what, scrap that small thing. 
then I'm not even going to do it. We wrongly conclude that it doesn't matter that much. This small God-honoring habit, this little faithful decision, this small good and positive action doesn't make that much difference at all. But take the opposite of this as well, and it's quite fascinating. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes to play Xbox or PlayStation. Yeah, and your wife doesn't like it. <laughs> not there yet, okay. <laughs> your wife's not happy, but she doesn't leave you. So you go, well, then it's fine. She's going to carry on. Or you skip church for a weekend, and you know what? Your whole world doesn't fall apart. There's not a huge tragedy. There's not a huge train smash. There's not a massive thing. You miss church, and you know what? Everything's kind of fine the next week. You eat the whole slab of chocolate before going to bed, and nothing major seems to change between the nighttime and the morning time. So you wrongly conclude that small bad decisions don't matter that much. And you see what happens. If you believe that the small good decisions don't matter that much, and you believe that the small bad decisions don't matter that much, you're missing the very thing that is impacting your life in a major way. And that is the small steps. It is the small decisions. It is the habits and the things that you're actually taking. All of your small decisions over the years have brought you to where you are now. Your life is a result of the st steps you've taken along the way. So... Your habits matter. Let's follow Paul's advice in Galatians 6 verse 9. He says this, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. Don't get tired of doing what's good. If it's a faithful thing, if it's a good thing, if it's a healthy thing, do not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You know, the thing about water, and all of us have got load shedding, right? Most of us are experiencing it. Some of us are lucky enough to have solar panels. Um, amazing. For the rest of us, when you want to make a cup of tea during load shedding, what do you do? Take out a pot, fill it with water, put it on the stove if you've got gas. Otherwise, you can't even do that. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and a watched kettle never boils. You've heard that expression. Well, it is true when you're waiting for the kettle to boil. And you know what? And it goes from 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And you know what? The water just gets hotter, but it's just hot water. At 99 degrees, it's just hot water. But something happens chemically. Something happens at 100 degrees. And the water moves from being hot to being boiling. And then it's ready for your tea. Sometimes you don't see the one degree going up and the two degrees going up and the three degrees. And you know what? That's what this verse is saying is that you've got to keep the fire going. You've got to keep the heat on. You don't look at it and go, well, nothing's happening here. Nothing's happening here. Now, I'm going to turn it off. No, you go, I'm going to wait for the kettle to boil. I want to move it from 99 degrees to 100 degrees. But sometimes with our habits, we don't do that. We say, this isn't working. This isn't working. This isn't working. But guess what? If you keep on plugging away at that thing, Eventually, it'll move from 99 to 100 degrees. Eventually, there will be a tipping point. Eventually, the water will start boiling. Eventually, that small step will become a habit, and it will impact your life in a wonderful, wonderful way. I'm going to close with a story quickly that my dad told me once. Um, I actually asked him to refresh my memory because I wasn't 100% sure. So he sent me a message today reminding me about this. So, Dad, if you're watching, I hope I get this right. But he was working in Botswana on, an, on, a, on a mine there, on a salt pan. And what happened was this guy and his wife went out for a drive on the salt pan. Their car broke down 40 kilometers away from the mine that they had left. 40 kilometers is quite a far away. Um, that's, I don't know what 40 k's is from here. It's a far way. It's not a way you can easily see or you would definitely want to walk. Not in a salt pan in Botswana with the heat, okay? It's definitely a difficult thing. But their car broke down. So his wife stayed in the car. He took a water bottle. And he was an ex, um, he was some kind of high up, I don't want to say scout because that sounds like Boy Scouts. He was like a proper scout. Um, and he thought that he could do this. And so he took a water bottle with him and he began walking back. So he, they radioed and they said to the guys, come and fetch us. We're about here. And they said, okay, cool, you just stay where you are. Anyway, he decided he knew better. And he began to walk. And he walked. This was on the Saturday. On the Monday, his wife came back in. So his wife was fetched. She came back in. On Monday, she came into the mine and said, we, we, we haven't seen him. He hasn't been back. 
We thought he'd be back by now. This is now days afterwards. And he's walking in the heat of a sewer pan or of, of a salt pan with one bottle of water. And what they did then, of course, they, they, they flew planes to try and find him over the salt pan. They could not find him in the direct line between his car and the mine. They just couldn't find him anywhere there. And so they actually hired special uh, local trackers to track him down. And they found him eventually under a bush four days later. Almost dead. Once he had come out of this, he said, I, I knew that I was going to die. There was nothing in him. They had to put seven liters of water in him just for him to be able to be sort of come back. It was a drastic situation. And, and what they found was they went back and they looked at what had happened. And he had broken his legs as a scout back in Namibia. And he was doing this thing, not realizing that, that he was walking in the right direction. But because his leg was a little bit one shorter than the other, one slightly crooked. He actually was walking in massive circles, massive circles. And so he, he couldn't work out why he obviously wasn't getting there. He was getting more and more dehydrated. There was less and less water. And he was just walking. And so because he was walking in a big circle, the plane was going over here from the car to the thing, but he was doing this. So of course, they didn't see him. Four days later, they find him almost dead under a bush. What's the point of that? One degree makes a massive difference. One degree makes a massive difference. To, to, to keep on going. You think your habit's a small habit. Well, he thought his steps were just small steps. But if your steps are in the wrong direction, guess what happens? You've got the New Year's resolution every year, don't you? But if your steps are in the right direction, you will get to the right place. Does that make sense? For me, that's just a wonderful picture, and it's a real-life story of make sure that you stay the course. Make sure that you wait until it ticks from 99 to 100 and the water is boiling. Keep on going. Don't get tired of doing what's good because at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Here's the line I wanna leave with you and it's the last thing I'm gonna pray. Small changes done consistently over time produce big results. Because everyone wants the big change. Everyone wants the big thing that's gonna happen all of a sudden in one miracle swoop. You want the silver bullet that cures your marriage, that fixes your parenting, that gets you out of debt. You want the silver bullet. It just doesn't work like that. Small changes done consistently over time have big results. Habits are critical. And next week, we're going to look at part two, and I'm going to speak about systems that you can have to help you to reach those big goals. Because that's what a lot of people lack. They've got the big goal. They don't have the system from here to there. And so next week, we're going to look quite practically. I want to encourage you to be here next week as well. But I want to pray for us as a church, and I'm actually going to ask that you would stand just to get some energy into you as well. And let's pray because right now I'm hoping, I'm hoping that even as I've been speaking, you've been thinking, okay, there is actually one or two things that I want to do. And I want to encourage you with this. Don't try more than two things this year. That's not trying to make you do little. That's not saying I've got a little faith in you. I know myself. I know human beings. I know that if we want to change everything in one year, it's not going to happen. So pick one or two things that you can begin to make small changes in. Can I encourage you to make one of them obviously spiritual? I say obviously spiritual because I believe everything is spiritual. I believe that if you've got a goal to lose two kilograms, I believe that's spiritual as well because you're taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I think that's spiritual, but what I'm saying is make one that's obviously spiritual. And maybe for you, that's just time in the morning with God. Before you email, before Instagram, before anything else, you've got that time with God, whether it's two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that's not the important thing. But maybe your habit needs to start there. Maybe it's prayer, maybe it's worship, maybe it's attending church more regularly. Maybe it's joining a small group this year. That's the small change you're gonna have. It's gonna have a big impact. Maybe it's to start serving. But choose one obviously spiritual thing that you can have it, that you can begin. And choose one which some people might not see as spiritual. But I tell you, it's all spiritual. Whether that's about your finances or it's about your friendships or your relationships 
or your fitness. It doesn't matter, but choose one or two things. Even this morning, let God just speak to you about those things and begin to make small changes because small changes done consistently over time produce big results. I'm gonna pray for us as a church. And Father, we come to you and Lord, we, we need your help with this. We know we need your help because we've tried without it and we haven't gotten very far. God, we need your help. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you've wired us. And Father, I thank you that although change is difficult, it's not impossible. Father, I pray that you would give everyone here the strength, the courage, the tenacity to push through those difficult moments, to push through as the water gets from 30 degrees to 99 degrees, to push through those difficult moments when it looks like things aren't working, when it looks like nothing's changing. God, I pray for a tenacity that will hang on until the water boils, that if we keep doing what we know is right, if we keep honoring you, if we keep putting you first, God, we know that in time, in your good time, there is a blessing, there is a harvest, there is a reward. We pray, Lord God, for a church that is wanting to do that, to fall more and more in love with you. Help us, Jesus. Amen. And while you're standing there, I actually wanna pray for just one more group of people, and that is, you might be here today, and I'm talking about falling more and more in love with Jesus, and for you, that's like, what? Maybe you've never had a walk with God, a relationship with God. You've heard these testimonies of some of the young guys in the church who have encountered God in a new and in a fresh and in a wonderful way on camp. Maybe you say, I've never had that. Never had that encounter. I've never had that experience. I've never given my life to, to God, surrendered it to Jesus. And if you want to do that, I wanna pray with you this morning. It would be the last thing that I do, but I wanna encourage you, if that's you, if we can bow our heads, if we can close our eyes, but if you today say, I wanna put my faith in Jesus, I wanna walk with him, I wanna start a relationship with him today, can I ask that wherever you are in the room, would you put up your hand quickly? I'm gonna see it, I'm gonna acknowledge you, and you can put it down. God bless you, God bless you. Is there anyone else that I haven't seen? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, thank you. Thank you at the back there as well. I think I've seen everyone, God bless you over there. You know what, there's, there's so many hands and this isn't a New Year's resolution. This isn't some flippant thing that we do. This isn't some small decision that you're making. What you're making now is the most important decision of your life. It's the decision to follow Christ. No one loves you more than Jesus does. And he proved it by dying for you, by shedding his blood so that your sins could be washed away so that you could have eternal life after this life, living with Him. And this morning, that's the invitation that God is extending to you. And so for those who have put up their hands, I wanna pray a prayer, and I encourage you just to pray it with me, just as a church, let's pray this out loud. But for those praying it for the first time or coming back to God, may this be a significant moment in your life. Let's pray, Father God, Thank you for loving me, for sending Jesus to die in my place so my sins could be forgiven. I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I give my life to you, God, every part of it. Take me and use me as you would. Thank you, you have wonderful plans for my life. Thank you that I'm your child. And thank you that today I am forgiven. Thank you so much, amen. Amen, come on. Why don't you take your seats for a moment. We're coming to the end of the service. And